Good evening, everyone. Thank you once again for participating in the Fifth Avenue Synagogue Sunday Lecture Series. And this evening, we have a very special program uh, planned for you. One of the most fundamental beliefs of traditional Judaism is that the law laws and the values of our Torah are immutable. They transcend time and are applicable in all societies and in all eras. It's not always easy to remain true to one's values in every situation. Sometimes there is great pressure from the outside to suspend one's beliefs for what people say is the greater good. And during those times, one needs to dig down deep and garner the strength and faith to remain true to one's ideals. Our speaker tonight, uh, David Schoen, an attorney at law, was in the world the world spotlight during the recent impeachment trials, and he made international headlines with his commitment to continue to observe the Shabbos despite the timing of the trial. He gave up the chance to present the closing arguments because it fell out on Saturday. I'm sure it was a truly challenging uh, decision to make, but he dug down deep and he made the courageous decision, which he believed was the right one, and by doing so, he taught us all a very powerful lesson. Professor Alan Dershowitz, who himself recently spoke to our community not too long ago, which was a wonderful evening, uh, will formally introduce Mr. Schoen. And it's so great to have you join us once again, um, Professor Dershowitz. If I, if I could kindly call upon Pre President uh, Jacob Gold to begin this evening's program. So uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Alan for coming back uh, this evening. Alan is a super mensch, and now he's part of uh, Malavani's backup choir for Yom Kippur. <laughs> so, uh, so we're excited about that. So I, I'm not even going to try to introduce um, Alan because Alan's purpose is to introduce David. But Alan is uh, one of the greatest defenders of individual rights. He's uh, probably the lead attorney for the Jewish state in the public opinion. And uh, more importantly, he's a close friend. And I uh, really appreciate, Alan, your participating in tonight's program. Well, thank you. I, <clears throat> I love your shul. I love your rabbi, your chassan, and many of your members. And it's a pleasure to introduce uh, a great man, David, David Schoen. Uh, when I watched uh, David uh, make his arguments in front of the Senate, on Arab Shabbos, but not Shabbos. When I watched him make that argument, um, what came to mind is a Pusik from Bayera, where um, Hashem is talking to Avraham and telling him what he plans to do to the citizens of Saddam, essentially plans to impeach them and remove them with prejudice. And, and, and Avraham turns to God and uses the strongest words ever recorded in any religious text against God. Chalila, chalila lacha, hashofet kal ha'aretz lo ya'aseh mishpat, far be it from thee. It would be profane of you, profane of you, chalila. Can you imagine a stronger word if the, if the king of all the justices, of all the justice will not himself do justice? What if he's innocent? What if there are 50 innocent people among the guilty of a Saddam. And I thought of David when I read those words because David obviously wasn't speaking to Hashem, but he was speaking to power. He was speaking to the United States Senate. And in order to say what he did and in order to overcome what 144 scholars said would be a frivolous argument, that is a disbarable argument because that's what it means to make a frivolous argument you need one quality, and that's a quality that I'm familiar with and all of your congregants are familiar with, and it's called chutzpah. I wonder how many of you know that the first time the word chutzpah is used in Jewish literature, it's to describe Abraham talking to Hashem. The word chutzpah kal shamaya appears in the description of Abraham's, if not rebuke, at least challenge to God, God, the Lord of all the justice, will you not yourself do justice? What if there are 50 innocent, righteous people? Would you sweep them away along with the guilty? 
And basically, from that confrontation between Avram and Hashem comes the legal principle that we all know about, better 10 guilty go free than one innocent be wrongly confined, because in the end, Hashem says, if there are 10, I will not destroy the city on behalf of the 10. But if there are only nine or eight or seven, you know, he did obviously destroy the city. So we have to strike a balance. And whenever I read this, this Parsha from now on in the future, I'll always think of David standing in front of the United States Senate, speaking truth to a justice. Um, and it took courage and it took chutzpah for him to do it. He didn't win any popularity contests. Um, there are many who would now condemn him or even try to discipline him for making what were essential arguments, essential to the survival of democracy, that these constitutional arguments be made. Now, I have no idea what David Schoen's politics are, and it is utterly irrelevant. It doesn't matter one bit whether he was a Democrat or Republican, a Trump supporter or a supporter of Biden. Myself, I defended President Trump on the floor of the Senate as well a year earlier, and I'm a liberal Democrat. I voted for the Democrats. I did not vote for Donald Trump. But that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who David Schoen voted for. What it matters is he stood up for the Constitution. He stood up for the provisions of the Constitution that re require for impeachment, treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. And he stood up for the Torah. He became the modern Sandy Koufax of the legal profession. I grew up with Sandy. He lived just down the block from me, actually play basketball against him. You wouldn't call what I did playing basketball. What he did was playing basketball. Uh, but he lived right down the block. His father, Irving, was our local lawyer. And he became famous even before he was a great pitcher for his refusal to pitch on Yom Kippur. We famously know about the second time when he was already famous, but he also refused to pitch on Yom Kippur earlier in his career when he was only a bench straddler on the Brooklyn Dodgers. It took chutzpah. It takes chutzpah to do that. And David is a man of intellect, a man of chutzpah, a man of principle, a man who stands up for the Constitution, a man who will be forever remembered for his hand on his head um, <laughs> as he uh, drank the water and whispered the shock on the Edward Burrow and, and made us all as Jews proud, made us all as Americans proud. And I hope whether you're a Democrat or Republican, a Trump supporter or an anti-Trump person, you would be proud of David standing up and defending the Constitution. It's my great privilege to introduce a great lawyer, a great American, and a great Jew, David Trump. Thank you very much. Uh, I said to Professor Dershowitz when I was on his show that this kind of talk makes me cry because he has been my mentor since before I came a lawyer. Uh, he may not have known it, but... Uh, he was, I have every one of his books, and now we have the treat of having YouTube. So my kids and I watch his show on YouTube. And what I said to him, frankly, uh, I don't mind saying here, during the course of the impeachment case was, he did a, a YouTube, I guess it wasn't YouTube originally, but a Durst show on jurisdiction and on the First Amendment. And I said, I'd rather not show up, or I can show up, but then just play his video for the argument, and that would win the day in the Senate. And it's really true. Um, uh, thank you very much for the introduction, but, uh, you know, this is one of my heroes, so I would rather he be talking on this show than I talk, but uh, anyway, you're stuck with me for right now. Um, I thought we would talk, go ahead, Jake. Yeah, so, so uh, David, you, um, what were you going to say? You thought we'd talk? Oh, yeah, I, 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 how I, I got into it or something like that, but I'd rather you guide it. You tell me what you'd like me to talk about. Well, I, I think it'd be great for, you know, there are a lot of people on the webinar who maybe don't know you personally, maybe give your background, you know, where you grew up, how you got into law, okay. if you don't mind. Sure. I was uh, born in Freeport, Long Island. I lived in the city till I was about four. My dad uh, had been an FBI agent and then a lawyer, but he died when I was four. So my mother was left a widow at 33, two kids, couldn't really afford to live in the city. So we moved out and we ended up moving to Virginia. I had no formal religious background at all. Um, interestingly, I mentioned the other day, I think my experience was similar to many Americans. Two generations ago, my family was religious and uh, my great-grandfather was a founder 
I don't have to tell Professor Dershowitz about this, but a founder and president of Torah Vadas way back when. So, um, but then my family, I think, became more assimilated. I, I know they became more assimilated. I think my grandfather found he had to work on Shabbos. It was a very typical American experience. I got more and more interested in religion as I got older, and I sort of uh, moved toward it. So, but not until my 30s. I was about 35. I became Balchuva, whatever, and I uh, joined the Shul of Tzedek and became very friendly with Rabbi Schwartz and got involved uh, to Khan Kashrus and Shabbos. Became a way of life for me. My wife had the opposite background, daughter and granddaughter of Orthodox rabbis, but uh, so she decided to slum it and marry me. Uh, thank God, wonderful family as a result. But I grew up in Virginia, mostly just outside Washington, D.C. <clears throat> Felt I always wanted to be a lawyer, uh, maybe because my dad had been a lawyer. And I was always interested in civil rights work and criminal defense work. So without a father, I sort of was always looking for mentors. Um, and so I happened on this fellow judge, Leon Higginbotham, who had been a federal judge in Philadelphia and was friendly with my mom. He's somewhat of a historian on uh, slavery. He's written a great book called The Matter of Slavery. And uh, he just took me under his wing when I was a kid and then followed through. So when I finished law school, I knew I wanted to do civil rights work and I'd accepted a job with a big firm. He said, maybe do a clerkship first, go to the deep south. So I went to Alabama. I'd never known anyone who'd stepped foot in Alabama before. And uh, clerked for a wonderful judge, was like a father to me. I fell in love with, uh, his name was Truman Hobbs. He'd been sort of the preeminent trial lawyer in Alabama all along, by the way. And I don't just say this to give a shout out. I was reading Thershowitz's books all along. I mean, I, I wore the cover off of one of them when he describes various courtroom scenes and that sort of thing. And my, I had a goal of always trying to do this thing, a thing that he described with tapes in his book and all of that stuff. So um, anyway, he's been there all along with me, whether he knew it or not. So um, I went down there and then I decided not to do the big firm route. And I opened my own practice in Alabama and I began doing court appointed criminal work. My very first trial was a capital murder case and uh, which is a little scary. That should not be entrusted to a 25 year old. I actually second, second seated a guy, but he uh, was a very experienced lawyer but he panicked and uh, he, uh, I don't know, it's a quick story, I'll tell you. He um, did everything by notes. I don't generally do everything by notes, my opening and closing, but he was the boss, you know? So he did it by notes. And uh, while he's, I did the opening in the case, while he sat at the table, the defendant was going through his notes. He got up to deliver his closing argument and his notes were all out of order. And he got completely lost. I had never seen, well, it was my first case, but I've never seen that since, frankly. The judge called me up to the bench and said, I kind of thought you were going to do the closing. But I ended up having to do the sentencing. The guy who was found guilty, I had to do the sentencing phase myself. And he got life instead of death. But I learned a big lesson from the case. That was in Selma, Alabama. Um, so I started doing these civil rights cases. And then uh, I started doing class action. So I represented all of the emotionally disturbed kids in foster care in Alabama, struck down the foster care system, all the kids in the public school system, struck down the public school education system, and jails and prisons, indigent defense. That's the kind of stuff that interested me. And I kept my hand in criminal cases. So in New York, I was doing criminal cases, represented a group of so-called Israeli mafiosi, then I represented the head of the Russian mafia, and then uh, some Italians, a couple of bosses of the families, that sort of thing, then white collar stuff. Um, and that's kind of what I had done. I have as a sideline, ballot access cases. I bring cases around the country on behalf of Libertarian Party, independent candidates, um, and uh, other fringe parties, um, uh, Lenora Falani, uh, other fringe people. But I believe very strongly in the, uh, of, of having a full opportunity to get on the ballot and to cast your vote for the candidate of your choice. So in 2020, I represented a socialist candidate for president uh, to get her on the ballot in Washington, DC. She got on the ballot. She didn't win the election, but she got on the ballot. And uh, I was very proud to do that, frankly. Um, I was taking a task on a talk show the other night representing a socialist, I would do it every day of the week if it meant uh, if there were a ballot access issue um, involved. Um, so that kind of, you know, that, that's my practice generally. One other aspect of my practice is, it's very important to me, So I represent American victims of terrorism, generally against the PLO. Um, PLO finance terrorism might be another group that committed the act, but um, so I did a couple cases in New York and Washington, DC, and that's something that's very important to me. As a result of that, I uh, emceed a program at the United Nations on um, ways to uh, challenge terrorism through lawsuits and other means. Um, <clears throat> very important and pressing interest of mine. And I'm very sorry to see now uh, reports that we intend to renew funding the PLO 
notwithstanding their continuation of paying uh, martyr payments, so-called martyr payments. Um, I, in one of the cases, I was able to expose the whole martyr scam that goes on, was run by the widow of an arch terrorist. And um, anyway, that's something that interests me, but I guess that sort of takes us up to the impeachment. Yeah, so 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 because we are an Orthodox synagogue, can you tell, tell uh, sounds like at 25 was your first legal case, you said, correct? Yes. Yes. You said at 35, you, you got more into religion. Can you just talk about that for yeah. a minute or two before we <clears throat> sure. go forward? What happened is in my 20s, I was living in Alabama, which I love, and I met a conservative rabbi there. I was on my own. The Jewish community there took me in right away. Um, and I was surprised, frankly, I, on my drive down there, I had to stop to make a phone call. And um, I uh, it was a dark, uh, dark area. And I thought, oh, you know, a car pulled up. I thought uh, they heard a Jew came to Alabama. I'm in for it now, that kind of thing. All I knew about was the Klan, that sort of thing. I, I love Alabama now, and I was really taken in quite uh, quite well. So I, I found a conservative rabbi who I fell in with, and I started gradually modifying my behavior. I gave up shrimp. I used to eat a ham and cheese sandwich every day. All those kinds of things. Incrementally, I gave them up, and uh, I liked them very much. But then I moved to New York. I moved into a building that turned out to be a sort of a dormitory for the Shulah upset. It was on 95th and uh, Columbus. And uh, I didn't notice, as far as I knew, I'd never met an Orthodox Jew before in my life. So um, I didn't really even notice the yarmulkes. A guy came to me one evening, Friday, uh, Thursday, and said he wanted me to come to a program called Turn Friday Night into Shabbos the following Friday night. I said, sure. So I went to the shul, I paid my money. I had absolutely zero intention of coming back on Friday night. But I met this assistant rabbi there, Rabbi Thaw, gave me a big bear hug and made me feel welcome. So I thought, okay, I'll give it a shot. And I really fell in love with the place. I met the other rabbi, Rabbi Schwartz, the main rabbi of the shul. And I started going to services. And from that point forward, it really stuck. And I right away took on Kashrus and Shabbos. I have to say, I think it was easier because I lived in a building like that where most of the people seemed to be Orthodox. Um, and I really enjoyed you know, having meals at other people's impart apartments and that sort of thing. But I started from scratch. So that was a little tough. I found people were not at all judgmental, but I was. It felt awkward to me to all of a sudden you know, wear a kippah around. And, um, not be able to go to the restaurants with my old friends anymore, that sort of thing. So it was a, quite a transition, but my mother took to it right away, changed her kitchen to kosher kitchen, bought all new dishes and everything. She didn't want it to be a distancing factor. And, uh, and so it, it never was. So that's how I got into that. But, but, but just to be clear, uh, cause it means, but so basically you were in a building, someone uh, engaged you, invited you to a synagogue. The rabbi was very warm. You had a very positive experience, and and that led you to become religious. I mean, that's a fascinating. You you make it sound very simple, but it's a pretty fascinating story. It was a major life change for me. That that experience, you're right, because they were so welcoming, made all the difference. And by the way, I have Davin at your shul, and I found it also to be very well. I was a guy from out of town. People came up, they greeted me, all sorts of things. So that kind of thing makes a huge difference. Well, we, hope, we hope very you come awkward back. at my age. Go ahead. Uh -huh. I said we hope you come back and, oh, and absolutely. appreciate that compliment, but we work very hard to Beautiful. welcome all guests and uh, make people feel at home. So thank you so much. So so, uh, so, so so this is what age? About 35, give or yeah. take. This is when, and you're, you're still living in, you're living in New York full time. Right. I went up there to work on a case. It was an Israeli case uh, over in federal court in Brooklyn. And I went up to work on that case. And then I just, I stayed for a while. I went back and forth, Alabama and New York. Okay, but but you made you made the commitment and then you uh, you stuck with it, right? Uh, that's amazing. So 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 uh, let's go back to uh, the um, the impeachment case. So so t tell us maybe the process of, of of how you became you know the lawyer for the president of the United States. Yeah, they uh, really uh, shocked me. I was sitting at home on a Sunday night, having just finished dinner about six weeks ago now. And I got a call from a fellow who introduced himself, Mark Meadows. I knew right away Mark Meadows was the chief of staff. And uh, I had, it's funny, I wouldn't have picked up the number ordinarily. I didn't recognize the number. It was a North Carolina number. Somehow I picked it up. And he said, I wanted to just ask you if you would consider representing the president in his upcoming impeachment trial. So I was really taken aback. Um, I haven't done a lot of impeachment cases. I wanted to hear, the president at one point asked me, is this the kind of thing I do? I want to say, yeah, I've been practicing law about 200 years, so I've done a lot of them. I don't think there's anybody who's done a lot of them. And I don't think I could possibly, I know I couldn't possibly do it as well as Professor Dershowitz did. So I said, no, I don't really do impeachments. I do criminal work and civil rights work. But anyway, we talked for quite a while and he said, uh, he and the president would call me back the following day. 
Instead, about two hours later, President Trump called me, didn't introduce himself, but I recognized the voice right away. And he was just as gracious as could be. We talked for about 45 minutes, maybe, just getting to know each other, talking about the case a little bit. And he asked me if I would consider it. I said, I certainly would consider it. But as I had said to Mr. Meadows, for me, it would depend in part on who they had in mind for the team. I said, there were some people that I absolutely would not want to do it with. So Meadows asked me who that was. I said, I don't want to really insult your friend. He said, listen, when you work in Washington, if you want a friend, you get a dog. I don't really have friends like that. So I told him who, and he said those people would not be on the team. Um, so my hesitation still was, though, I'm a solo practitioner, and it's a pretty big undertaking. I have a heavy caseload already. And we basically, at that point, had you know about uh, two weeks or less to prepare for it. So I, cons I continue to say I would consider it. Monday, the president called me back, talked for about 45 minutes again, just very nice talk, and he kind of pumped me up. And uh, I said, you know, you can do this. I said I would think about it. I'd let him know by the end of the week. Meanwhile, I saw that they had named in the press a guy named Butch Bowers from South Carolina to handle it. So I wrote Mr. Meadows and I said, thank you for considering me. It looks like you've made your choice. He said, actually, we haven't. That was just a name that was leaked. So I then got a call asking me if I would quarterback that team in South Carolina. And I said, I'm happy to do it, but I don't think they would accept me. You've got five experienced lawyers there. They've never heard of David Schoen. And for me to come in and say, by the way, guys, I'm going to lead the team and do the talking. I didn't think that would fly, but the president called them up and told them that's what he wanted. And they, again, very graciously took me in. They reserved one or two spots for themselves, but they gave me some primary parts and we hit it off very nicely. However, during a phone call Friday evening and then Shabbos morning, which I couldn't participate in, uh, they had a falling out. So the two, that didn't work out, put it that way. And so on Sunday, the president called me again. We're now uh, nine days away from the start of the trial. And he said, David, uh, I want you to take this thing on yourself. I said, Mr. President, I, I really appreciate that vote of confidence. There's no possible way I could do that. I, I, again, I've never done an impeachment. There's a brief to be written. There's uh, arguments to prepare. It's just too big a job. I would need help. So he had someone, an assistant, uh, hired another firm. Uh, I had suggested some people. I, uh, very gracious during this period. You know, I went to Professor Dershowitz for advice over and over again. He just... Uh, without hesitation, took my call each time and advised me. Uh, Ken Starr was someone I had called. He um, recommended a couple of people that I could maybe, you know, get to help. But each time I mentioned somebody was kind of turned down and they wanted to pick somebody on their own. So they picked this fellow, Bruce Castor and his firm in Pennsylvania, and they got involved. Um, <clears throat> so there was some question about the roles at that time, but he came in with the firm and kind of took charge and set an agenda and gave out parts and that sort of thing, began giving interviews. In the background, you know, I was getting a little bit of pushback saying, you know, listen, you have to be more sort of a, you're supposed to be lead counsel. And I said, that's not really my role. It's for the client, I think, to make that clear, or the client's assistant and so on. And that never really happened at that point, but they were very nice fellows. So I met them finally when we got down to DC the day before it was to start. The impeachment trial started. Um, I think some people felt it got off to a rough start a little bit. Um, the other side made a good presentation, I thought. They're very bright folks. What, what was it? Remind, was it a Wednesday? Remind me. That was a Tuesday. It was a Tuesday. Okay. Not Tuesday. And we were only supposed to discuss jurisdiction. Under the Senate rules, we were given two hours to the side. They went first, then we would go to discuss jurisdiction, whether this case should have been brought and whether the trial should go forward. My position firmly was that it should not. Um, an impeachment, after all, is to remove a civil officer from office. President Trump was no longer in office. What I felt they were trying to do in effect was have a trial without any of the safeguards of a trial using the excuse that he had been a civil officer. Just as an aside, their theory of jurisdiction and impeachment in this case was so radical that I really felt um, that it presented a clear danger to the institution of the presidency and other offices. Their theory, it could have been, well, since he was impeached while he was still in office, we can go forward with the trial. I still think that's dead wrong once he's out of office. Their theory goes much further. Their theory is written on their brief, page 65, was that any person who dares to become a civil officer anytime is then subject to impeachment for any act or inaction done in office in perpetuity. So in other words, literally, if we had an ultra right-wing government come in, came in and said, you know what? Slavery wasn't such a bad thing. This guy Lincoln had it all wrong. He ruined our country, threw us into civil war. We're going to impeach Lincoln today because he tried to get rid of slavery. 
that could happen. More realistically, Eric Holder could be impeached for Fast and Furious, Barack Obama could be impeached for Benghazi, on and on and on. Um, and so I thought it was a tremendous abuse. I don't have any question about it. Um, so anyway, backing up, I think uh, the other side went and they did a pretty good job. They didn't stick to jurisdiction. They showed some sort of sexy movies, that sort of thing. They had hired a movie company to make their presentation for them and a large New York law firm. It was a very professionally done presentation. Who, who uh, pays for their side out of curiosity? It's a good question. I, I, I think, I don't really know, but there, I've heard that Democratic National Committee, I really don't know. I actually used to represent the Democratic Party. Uh, they were sued once and I represented them at trial and successfully you know, defended the case. I did that with the law firm, Hogan and Hartson. I used to be you know, sort of close with them. Since then, I just don't get involved with politics at all. Um, but you know what happened? The other side did a pretty good job. So Mr. Castor stood up and he said, I think he thought you know, he was kind of whatever, um, most experienced lawyer there or something. And he said, uh, listen, you know, we're in a little bit of trouble now. I think I better go and respond to the argument they made. So uh, I, uh, I didn't take that as quite the confidence the president had shown in me, but I was certainly, you know, if he felt he had the courage to get up and that's what had to be done, I admired him for that. He said he had written out an opening statement and so he was gonna give that more on the substance now and he hoped to reserve some time for me. So he went and- uh, This is what day, this is Wednesday? That's or the first day on Tuesday. Still Tuesday. Yeah, okay. Mr. Castor went. He was first up for our team. So he got hit pretty hard in the media with that presentation. Um, the, he did leave some time for me. I kind of rushed through my jurisdiction uh, talk and I was happy with the way it went. Um, thankfully, Professor Dershowitz gave me a good mark on it, on his uh, show. And um, so from that point, the dynamic changed a little bit. The president was kind of upset at the reviews that had been in the media. I thought it was, I was afraid just on a personal level that they were too brutal to Mr. Castor. And I stood up for him publicly because of that. Here's a man who'd been practicing 35 years and we would walk into the war room and in front of him, you know, CNN would play. This was the worst performance by a lawyer we've ever seen and all that. I was afraid, you know, how's he gonna get up in the morning? And I thought that was unfair to him at that point. And you can't make a statement about a guy's career based on one performance. He had the right intention and people agreed to it and so on. Anyway, uh, we finished with that. We lost the vote on jurisdiction. We had, I think at that point, 44 votes, I think for jurisdiction, um, that there was no jurisdiction. I had felt strongly about the issue. And I think it's an issue that stayed with the case throughout. That is that I think that even though the Senate voted that they had jurisdiction, each and every Senator in his or her own mind and conscience could vote against the impeachment because they didn't think the impeachment should be there. And of course, that's what Senator McConnell said publicly. I have issue, take issue with what Senator McConnell said because he said, I voted against him because I didn't think it should have been here, no jurisdiction sort of thing. However, I think Donald Trump was morally responsible for the insurrection as they call it. I don't think that's a fair commentary for the primary reason that um, the house managers even acknowledged they did not have the evidence in this case. Um, they said it's a fact intensive case, but they acknowledged we don't have the facts. We still don't. There are ongoing investigations that seem to indicate well, first of all, I don't think there's any connection between the speech and the insurrection or the riot that happened there. I think the riot was committed by vicious criminals on their own agenda. And if you were to find that President Trump's speech was somehow illegal or insightful, then I think you're gonna chill passionate political speech uh, across the board, period. That was the, the other real danger that attracted me to this case. You know, it sounds presumptuous and especially presumptuous in front of a great uh, constitutional scholar like Professor Dershowitz, but I honestly felt that I was defending the constitution when I stood up there. And that was my most important role, I thought. Um, there were principles at stake there that I think are vitally important to our democracy. After all, remember their agenda in this case was to bar President Trump from ever running for office again. Okay. That means- how, how, how does that work, by the way? How, how can you bar someone for, forever? Well, how does that work? Yeah, the provision in the constitution that provides for removal, provides for removal, and then other sanctions, including uh, an inability to hold public office, office of uh, office of trust, that sort of thing. So they, a person could be barred, a civil officer could be barred from holding office in the future. It would have been challenged constitutionally, of course, um, as part of this jurisdictional challenge and otherwise. And by the way, I had an interest in filing a legal challenge ahead of time to bar this impeachment trial from going forward. I thought there were some grounds for it. 
However, the president wanted to take this thing head on. He didn't want to appear to be trying to evade it. And I think he probably made, I think he made the right decision. I still think there's important legal considerations uh, that could have been addressed, but you know, listen, it's always difficult to get the court to hear the case. So I don't know, I think this was the right decision, but um, the effect of what they, their agenda was, would have been essentially to disenfranchise at least 74 million voters who cast their vote for President Trump and might want to in the future. And that's the kind of thing that I find constitutionally offensive and offensive to our notion of democracy. The other part that I thought was so offensive here was the complete lack of due process from the snap impeachment that happened in the House, never before happened, zero days, no committee hearings, no investigation. Um, and so, uh, and then they impeached. And then to this uh, Senate, they call it a trial, but believe me, you know, any lawyer would love the opportunity to get up in front of a group, know that you can't be interrupted, know you don't have to worry about a witness's answer to any question you're gonna ask, and uh, you know, uh, make that kind of talk. But beyond that, not have to worry about any rules of admissibility, uh, rules of evidence, otherwise, um, anything. It's just loosey goosey. And I'll tell you one last thing that I'd like to tell you. Go ahead. Somebody. No, it's okay. I think Alan, it's okay. Go, go ahead. Go okay. Ahead. One thing that I think should shock, I hope would shock the American people, if they haven't thought about it yet, is in no other forum in America, in most countries, would this have happened. The presiding judge in the case, the president pro temp, was uh, Senator Patrick Leahy from Vermont. Seems like a fine guy. Spoke to me all the time, you know, when I come in in the morning, as nice as could be. But Senator Leahy, a very experienced Senator, Democrat, uh, on January 13th, issued a press release saying, what President Trump did is one of the most horrendous acts in American history. He, Senator Leahy, will vote to convict him. And every Senator, including all of the Republicans, has an obligation to vote to convict President Trump. That's January 13th, three weeks before the trial. January 27th, two weeks later, he signed an oath. It's an oath that's been around since the 1800s in which he swore to be an impartial juror in the case. So first think about the notion that the judge is also gonna be a juror in the case. But secondly, think about even if somehow by some stretch of the imagination, he could have put apart, put a uh, gun past his predetermination in the case. Think about the appearance of it. The appearance of a Senator who has already sworn to, who has already said he's gonna vote guilty and everybody else has to before he's heard the first stick of evidence, then signs an oath that he'll be impartial. The appearance of that is uh, horrible. And uh, in no other setting in which life or liberty is at stake in this country could that possibly be tolerated. He's mm, memory right. sitting now as the judge over the proceeding, deciding all evidentiary questions, running the rules of the game, and he has a vote on guilt or innocence. It's, I agree. Uh, no place. For that. It's, it's un American in every sense. So that's another reason I wanted to jump in mm -hmm. and found it <laughs> offensive. Yeah, I agree. Um, so, so, you know, so, so, about, so this is a walk. So this is your all is on Tuesday or your no no that was you know Tuesday Wednesday third Wednesday and Thursday the other side made their presentation okay their presentation you know I had said in my opening on jurisdiction this wasn't necessary first of all President Biden said well we have to go through this trial but we can't just forget about this in order to aid the healing process and for unity and for accountability so I used those as some of my themes and I addressed each one. I found this thing to be completely antithetical to the idea of healing and of unity. I thought it would tear the country apart. And I think it did. I think it backfired because President Trump, according to the polls, got momentum from this thing afterwards, after the acquittal and after the videotapes exposing the double standard and the hypocrisy. Um, it certainly wasn't for healing. And what I suggested on that front was, why do we need to show a video of people being hurt and killed in the Capitol? We know that that happened to show it over and over and over again on video certainly had emotional appeal to many people, but I thought it was just the wrong thing to do for the country. And I said so from the start of the case, it wasn't necessary. We would have stipulated to the riot, we would have stipulated people were hurt and killed. And I offered to do that right out of the blocks, but they wanted to show it for the impact that it had on some. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> certainly not a positive impact toward unity and uh, healing. You know, Professor Dershowitz, I mean, you would have so much to add to any of this stuff. Please don't hesitate to jump in because you think you're, you know, cutting over me. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. The only thing I would add is, of course, the Constitution provides that when a president is uh, tried under an impeachment, the chief justice must preside um, and the chief justice refused to preside. And I think that sends a message 
from the Supreme Court that this was not a proper proceeding because this would not only have been the impeachment of a person for acts he did while president over which the chief justice should preside, but it would also preclude him from ever running again for president. And I think if you brought the framers of the constitution together and said, did you think that the president pro temp of the Senate who had already made his decision should preside? They would say, of course not. The chief justice has to preside, but the chief justice made his views known loud and clear. He didn't give reasons for why he wouldn't preside, as far as I know, no public reasons. Right. But I thought that helped to validate your point. And look, I think you made a very, very strong point about uh, jurisdiction because the, and, and I have to tell you, you know, uh, the lawyers on the other side, some of them are my former students, and of course, uh, went to Harvard Law School and were very distinguished. Um, the chief counsel was my student, uh, and I think did very well in my in my class. But I I do think that the argument in their brief was absurd. It went so far they could have easily said that when a president is impeached while in office, then he can be tried when he leaves office. But the idea that you could now try Barack Obama, or you could now try Bill Clinton, you could now try any of the other presidents uh, went so far and was so absurd. And it became a mechanism by which one party could prevent the strongest candidate from another party from running for office and deny 70 some odd million people the vote. I think you made that point very uh, effectively. But the question I wanna ask you is this, what has been the impact for you? I mean, you are a civil rights lawyer, a civil liberties lawyer, a criminal lawyer. I know for me, um, I'm living on Martha's Vineyard and it's very easy for me to socially isolate because nobody wants to talk to me here because I defended the president. Have you had similar reactions or do you live in a different community and is your community more sympathetic? My community is utterly unsympathetic to the fact that I stood up for the constitution on behalf of President Trump. Right. Well, first of all, I mean, you know, you, you've done that on several occasions. And I think in your case, you know, first of all, you're, you know, probably the most high profile lawyer in the country and for decades, that sort of thing. And people, you know, on the left thought you were theirs. You know, this is our Alan Dershowitz because you've been such a strong civil libertarian all of this time. And so I think it surprised some people. So you've faced greater backlash than I think anyone else could face, which also then is a tribute to the courage you've shown. Um, because uh, it would have been very easy for you not to take any position at all. You didn't get anything out of personally out of stepping up here and you suffered a great deal for it. But this is what you've done your entire career. This is why I say on one of the very important issues, you've always been my mentor. That is on the obligation in a sense of a lawyer to represent the underrepresented or the unpopular. You've mm -hmm. done that your whole career and you've spoken and taught about it. That's something I've tried to adopt in my practice well, I, I appreciate that, but you're wrong about one thing. I did get something out of it, and I just got the news the other day. Uh, as you probably remember, um, I was asked to represent a number of people who were seeking commutations and pardons, many of them from the Orthodox Jewish community. And I did it through Aleph, um, um, uh, mostly almost all pro bono cases. And um, I recently learned that one of the people I got a commutation for who had gotten a 700 year sentence. He had been offered a seven year sentence, but he went to trial, he got a 700 year sentence. And I helped get him out of prison. And the other day he had a stroke yeah. and he would have died had he been in prison. And yeah, his right. life read about it. saved. And so for me, being able to perform the mitzvah of Pidyon Shibuim, whether on behalf of guilty people or innocent people, but all people who got excessive sentences because they refused to accept a guilty plea, refused to make guilty plea. For me, that was worth everything. The fact that the president was willing to listen to me. I don't think I got any special consideration. The cases I presented were just, and half of them he didn't grant. He didn't grant a couple of that. I really was very anxious for him to grant one an 80 year old man who was gonna die in prison. But the fact that the president was willing to listen to my computations was really worth all the criticism I got from many people, including members of the Jewish community who were outraged at the fact that I would represent the president, this president. Did you get some of that from members of your community? Sure, and from, you know, around the country, around the world. I, I mean, 
in the last couple of weeks, I've gotten some of the most beautiful emails I've ever received in my life, mostly because of this, you know, the Jewish angle on the case, but also just good old Americans um, who really felt the Constitution was at risk here. However, I, I got right. another one today. There's one person who's written to me now six times, full page uh, emails about what he should have done to me, what he'd like to do to me, what Hitler should have done to my whole family. And I get those phone calls also. Private number comes up. You know, these people are all anonymous. And then uh, they curse at you and call you the regular names, that sort of thing. But in terms of sort of the cancel thing, I would say for me, it's been small potatoes. Um, and I uh, wouldn't have, certainly wouldn't have changed my view on whether I, I should have taken this case or not. But I was scheduled to, I've mentioned this, I guess, before to you. Um, I was scheduled to teach a civil rights course in the fall in a law school. I've been negotiating with them for a while because they want to beef up their civil rights curriculum. And I always wanted to teach. I used to teach criminal procedure in a law school. I just love being around the students. Um, your students are being cheated now because you retired. That's the ultimate experience having you as a professor. But putting that aside, I'm not you, but I would do the best that I could do. And uh, I contacted the Dean when I accepted this uh, thing. I said, it's gonna come out in the paper that I'll be representing President Trump. Do you think that would affect my appointment in the fall? They said, frankly, it would. Uh, some of the students and the faculty would be uncomfortable if you were to teach here. So I felt very bad about that, but I didn't want to make anybody but, uncomfortable. You know, I have to tell you, just to add one more thing, uh, if I were back teaching at Harvard Law School, there would be protests in front of my classes, even though I was, you know, one of the most popular teachers and I would have 500 people applying for 15 places in my seminar. Today, there would be protests, there would be efforts to try to stop me from teaching, sure. there would be efforts to silence me, um, because academia today is not the most comfortable place for somebody who is in any way associated with anything on behalf of President Trump, even if it was just the constitutional rights of President Trump. You know, I got no problem when I represented or defended the rights of Nazis to march through Skokie, Illinois, where many Holocaust survivors um, live. But representing President Trump, that was beyond the pale of acceptability in most academic places. So you may have been spared an unpleasant experience, mm -hmm. but. Uh, I think you would be a great teacher and you should be uh, invited to teach and lecture about your experiences. Thank you. It is shocking though, how this political sort of weaponization in the process that's gone on, not just the impeachment, but the partisanship that's marked everything now uh, has taken over. As I, sa I said, you know, I represented the Ku Klux Klan in a March case before. No one identified me with the Ku Klux Klan because of that. In fact, I right. got the leader of the Klan on the phone ahead of time. The ACLU hired me. It was a March case. I want to march with masks and the town didn't want to let them march and they want to charge them a fee, couldn't wear their masks. So I litigated, I think it was an easy case to win. Um, but uh, but I got the guy on the phone ahead of time. His name was Jordan Golub, head of the Mississippi clan. I said, uh, Mr. G I want to get him on the phone so I don't put in a couple hundred hours pro bono and then here, I don't want a Jew lawyer. So I said, Mr. Golub, you know, I want to tell you, I'm right up front, I'm Jewish. He, oh my God, well, it's better than, at least you're not, better than being a Zionist Jew. I said, well, let me give you the rest of the bad news then. So uh, he says, all right, listen, I wish you were white and Christian, but okay, I'll use you, you know, grudgingly. Um, nobody associated me with his thinking. I have two or three death penalty cases a year. Right now I'm taking on post-conviction, a case in which a person killed a woman and her two children senselessly. People say, oh, that's God's work. You're down in Alabama doing death penalty work, Brian Stevenson, et cetera, et cetera. That's so great. But you represent President Trump, you're canceled. I don't want anything to do with you. People, they just told me in my softball league, the captains had a meeting and they said, if I'm playing, they won't go on the field with me because I represented President Trump. I was taken off of a listserv of civil rights lawyers, which hurt very badly. They're very prominent civil rights lawyers. And I got a lot out of the listserv, but this kind of thing. And it's, it's all wacko. I represent a guy now in a case in Florida, horrible police shooting case. I think one of the most important police shooting cases in the country, Black Lives Matters has rallied around, Black Lives Matter has rallied around the case. My local counsel was just forced by his firm to pull out of the case because I represented President Trump. I said, think about what you're saying. This is a, case, a civil rights case against the shooter of an innocent African-American man. Black Lives Matter supports our case and you're pulling out because I represented Donald Trump in another case. It's just, it's craziness to me. So, um, so, so, so I, I wanna ask you both a question uh, regarding the craziness going on in the world. But, but before we do that, you know, David, uh, one of the, and Alan, I know interviewed this and I saw this, but one of the most remarkable things 
was walk us through the Friday, the decision not to do the closing arguments, because I, I think, you know, we're an Orthodox synagogue, and I think that's very important for you to explain mm -hmm. that process. Please. What happened is when I took on the case at the beginning, they thought it was going to go maybe two weeks. I said, so you understand, I won't be able to work on Friday night and Saturday. No problem, they said. And so as we got closer, I made contact with Senator McConnell's office, leader on the Republican side. I talked to his aide about how to handle it. And so then I drafted a letter that I wrote, short letter, explaining my observance and saying from 524 on Friday night until Saturday night, I wouldn't be able to participate. At that time, they were thinking of running through seven days, straight through. So the Senate was going on recess. They wanted to get out of there. Um, I wrote the letter and I got word right away that Senator Schumer approved it and it was going to pass. However, we got word that some of the senators were a little bit upset, that they wanted to get on the recess. It's a question about how the vote was going to go, if people were annoyed and that sort of thing. And I said, listen, I don't want to be responsible for inconveniencing 100 senators based on my religious uh, practices. Um, so I said to the President Trump, that former President Trump, that um, here's the situation. Now I said, we can, I can withdraw it. And, but not be able to participate Saturday. or And so he was aware of the fact that some senators were upset. He said, I don't want you to have to miss a day. But at that time, we didn't think Saturday would be such an important day. It's supposed to end on Tuesday for the closings. He said, listen, even if you have to miss the day, I think it's better to not uh, anger the senators, withdraw the, uh, the request. So I withdrew the request and explained that I didn't want to inconvenience anyone. We would make some personnel changes. And so that's how it came. Um, I had suggested originally we start again in the afternoon on Sunday, so I didn't interfere with any Christian practices, and that was acceptable to them. By the way, uh, even after I withdrew it, I went up to Senator Schumer, and uh, we were told ahead of time not to just approach them. You have to sort of be invited into their space, and he invited me. So I said, Senator Schumer, I just wanted to thank you for your graciousness in ex ex acceding to my request. I know it was going to cause inconvenience. He said, well, you know what my name is, don't you? I said, I really didn't, but I thought Schumer. I said, okay, Schomer? He said, yeah, Schomer is really my name. And so I explained to everyone what the thing was with the covering the head and the Shabbos thing and all that. So it was going to be fine, he said. Um, and Senator Leahy spoke to me about it. He said he's a person of faith and he respected the faith very much. Um, so I withdrew that. But I have to say to you that I guess on this experience, the mo some of the most moving uh, parts of it have been for me. The emails I've gotten from people, for example, I got an email from a person who works at Goldman Sachs. He said, I've always kind of been uncomfortable about whether I could wear my keeper to work, what I tell them about Shabbos when I have to miss. He said, and I felt that somebody at this level, the impeachment trial the, on the world stage, president of the United States, felt comfortable making these things public at least, or you know, just talking about how he felt about it, that I can say whatever I want in my workplace. And I've heard that over and over and over again. I'm someone who grew up, you know, again, without any formal religious background, but it was worse. I grew up at a public school in Virginia as far as I knew, there wasn't anybody Jewish, you know, to be seen. And uh, I didn't want anybody knowing I was Jewish. It's not just that I didn't actively practice. My mother had no idea about this, by the way, and we shared everything. But I, uh, I really was petrified. Someone, I can remember someone sort of outing me at one point, and somebody stood up for me and said, yeah, sure, red hair. Is he Jewish? I had hair, actually, then. Is he Jewish? And this person said, of course not. I let it go. So I know what it's like a little bit to feel intimidated about that. I, I, I'm ashamed that I felt that way then. But, um, but so I, I'm, I'm really pleased that this had that kind of impact. I'm not learning enough to inspire anyone through Torah learning, but if some act that I did, whether by happenstance or otherwise, somehow inspired someone, I feel great about that. I've spoken since to a couple of schools in the New York area and the response from the kids, is just terrific. Tonight, I left shul after Mincha tonight and the son of a local Rosh Hashiva came up to me I said, I knocked on my window in the car. I said, I'd just like to talk to you for a second. Yeah. I said, um, he said, I just want to tell you, you know, I watched the impeachment, a tape of it. And the things that you did when I heard about Shabbos and covering your head to make a bracha and all that, he said, it was really inspiring to me. I'm now in the workplace. He's a kid who took a little different path. Instead of learning, you know, for 10, 12 years afterwards, he got in the workplace. He said, so I'm facing these things. And he said, now I know what to do. And all mm -hmm. that well, you know, David, you and I have something else in common that I didn't realize until you said that your family was involved in Torah Vadas Yeshiva. My grandfather, Louis Dershowitz, Leibel Dershowitz, uh, along with uh, a, a Rabbi Wilhelm, sure. uh, were the, among the founders of the Yeshiva. There's a plaque to my grandfather, and my grandfather on the Dershowitz side met my grandfather on the Ringel side. 
both were on the board of Torah Vidash Yeshiva, and that's how my parents met. And so if not for Torah Vidash Yeshiva, I would not be here in the world. So wow. I'm sure your grandfather or father bears some responsibility for that as well. So we have in common, having had red hair when we were kids, I was a writer, <laughs> right Torvadas Yeshiva as our beginning, and uh, and lawyers who've been condemned for representing the Constitution. It's good company. I'll settle for carrying your bags. I will never be in your league. Uh -huh. the uh -huh. But um, yeah, no, I knew that story about Torvadas, by the way, with you. And uh, interestingly, I had mentioned this, my connection to one of the schools I spoke to. So the following day, I got an email. This is about three days ago from the executive director of Torah Vidas saying he would like to send me their 100th anniversary book with my uh, great grandfather in it. So um, I'm waiting to get that now. So that was also a very nice experience. I've just had some wonderful experiences uh, in that regard. Um, listen, there are gonna be haters out there, that's for sure. But um, I do think President Trump has gotten a great deal of momentum from this, uh, according to the polls at least. You know, I don't know how, that play, how that's gonna play out in the future. That's up to him, I suppose. So, um, so, 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 David, your decision not to do the closing, that was your own decision. You, it wasn't a rabbinical decision, correct? Correct. I mean, look, my decision about Shabbos, many people have suggested, oh, you could have gotten a heter, gone in there, don't use the microphone, don't take notes. I don't go from notes in that situation anyway. But I thought that would have sent absolutely the wrong message to just show up like it was another work day. I think it would have undermined the very purpose of, you know, what I had in mind to at least, you know, um, celebrate Shabbos like it was Shabbos. I ended up walking to a shul about six and a half miles away. My son was with me. Oh, last, you know what I want to tell you, though, I think important maybe for your crowd. One of the things that was so important to me about this is that I made it a family event um, project. When I, got, when I finally decided I would take this on, I sat my family down. We have five kids. One's in Israel, um, but he was on the phone. And I said, let's make this a family project. Let's look at the constitutional provisions involved, the First Amendment and the impeachment provisions, learn about those. So I have, you know, a considerable library of First Amendment books. My kids dug into it. Each took a different issue on the First Amendment. Great. I said, I think that the country is so divided now, the only parallel I could think of was the period of Lincoln. So I said, let's pull some speeches from Lincoln. And uh, Lincoln loved poetry. Let's pull a poet who Lincoln loved and who wrote around that time period about unity, the need for unity, stop the divisiveness. So one of my daughters came up. She just took a course on Lincoln, actually, in college. And um, she pulled some of that material for me. And then we sat around and we discussed all of the issues every day. Um, they modified some of the remarks that I wanted to make. And uh, we went from there, but it was an entire family project. One of my sons went with me. That was an exciting, he's applying to law school now, so he's off. And that was an exciting experience for him. Um, just graduated from Yeshiva University and he played a great role in it. They, um, one of the, in the brief, the house managers, they had a provision in which they said, they were like talking about the horror of Donald Trump and they said the founding fathers knew how to deal with this kind of thuggery. Um, they expected it and so on. And they cited to his, an historian named Bernard Balin. My son was a history major. He said, something's just not hitting me right here. So he pulled the page from Bernard Balin's book, which he had. And he said, dad, look at what they're talking about here. These were the founding fathers, they're not founding fathers. These were the early colonists talking about democracy. That's the kind of thuggery they were afraid of. They were vitally afraid of democracy. Right. But what the quote meant really was, uh, they were likening Trump to democracy in a sense. So we used that and it sort of backfired on them. I was very proud of my son for finding You know, it's a, it's a small world. Uh, Bernie Balin was a good friend of mine. Uh, he <laughs> took Harvard for many years and we were part of the Jewish lunch group uh, at, at Harvard. And, uh, you know, I have a very different story about Shabbos uh, that I, I need to in sharing with you because I came out a different way. So I went to Brooklyn College and I was on the Brooklyn College debating team. And we had a big debate tournament at Harvard. And I had never been to Harvard, the idea of a kid from Borough Park going to Harvard. And I pleaded with my mother and my grandmother, can I go up to Harvard? Of course, the debate was on Shabbos. And finally, um, um, my mother said, all right, you can go. You have to, of course, go on Friday, you have to come back on Sunday, and you cannot take any notes. You can't bring a pen or a pencil. Of course, I wouldn't, because that would be, you know. But she said to me, Avi, you don't need notes. We have a good memory in our family. And as the result of that, I went and I won the debate without taking notes. And that became my signature for all of my legal career. I have never, ever taken a note 
while arguing a case or listening to a case because I think it distracts. And it was my mother, because of Shabbos, who taught me how to listen, Beautiful. how to really listen and not to take a single note Beautiful. and to have a great mind. <laughs> thank you, Alan, for sharing. And thank you, David, for sharing how you included your family. I think that's uh, very meaningful. And uh, that's great you gave your son that experience to be a part of that. Yeah. But uh, I had a question for both of you. So, uh, you know, this whole thing with censorship, I, I don't really understand it, but the way, I don't want to get into Donald Trump specifically, but you can block someone on Twitter. Is this a new phenomenon? Can, can you uh, each expound on it? And um, I mean, anyone can get blocked today, I assume. Like who, who makes these decisions? Is it the CEO of these companies or where are we headed? Go ahead, Professor. Well, I'll, let me tell you one thing where we're headed. Who makes the decisions? The 92nd Street Y has made the decision to cancel me. And well, well, I'm, I'm happy with that one, but we got you. That's a good one. Yeah, I know have they, you know, 25 years at the 92nd Street Y, and they've canceled me. Temple Emanuel, I think, has canceled me. As you know, I was doing every year a trial of a Jewish biblical figure, mm -hmm. and they canceled me. And normally it's five people who say, let's cancel him, and a thousand people who want to listen. So it's so undemocratic because cancellation, the real victim <clears throat> is not the speaker. I can speak anywhere I want. The real victims are the audience, the people at the 92nd Street Y who want to hear me, who want to hear David, who want to hear people. But the 92nd Street Y won't allow it to happen, and Temple Emanuel won't allow it to happen. So cancel culture's biggest victim. I have a new book that's coming out this month. It's called the case against the new censorship. Um, and it's how the big tech and universities and progressives are now canceling people. So I'm sorry for grabbing that answer, but I just wanted to make my point about the 92nd century why before David makes his point. Not at all. I wanted you to uh, give the answer. You're really the master with this stuff. I, um, it's interesting, you know, this question. I, I think it's very scary what's happening with Twitter and other social media. It's clearly viewpoint-based, content-based, and that's exactly what you know we argue against in the First Amendment and other areas. Part of the, the problem lies with Congress now. I think you know these social media uh, forums have been given immunity, basically, from lawsuits um, for for this kind of action. I think Congress is going to have to modify that. We said an interesting, you know, interesting article uh, yesterday, I think, um, showing that Louis Farrakhan is permitted on Twitter to put forward absolutely absurd points of view on things like the election and uh, and other things. And the other side of that coin is ba barred from Twitter. Um, this is the worst kind of censorship we've seen. The social media is very powerful these days. That is the public forum. And uh, there's gonna have to, Congress is gonna have to make some changes to remove, remove the immunity, I think. And I think people are gonna have, the consumer is gonna have to make a change, go to different platforms, hurt them in the pocketbook, I think a little bit. You know, you see, if you cancel or censor someone like, let's say, Professor Dershowitz, because he's here, you're losing such an enriching experience. He doesn't give you one point of view. He presents all of the point of views and engages. Every young person should be exposed to all of that so that that young person can make their mind informed. In his law school class, he's not telling people how they should think, what they should think right. about issues. He uses the classic Socratic method. He makes them think. That's why you want to be in his class, to learn how to think, how to make these decisions on important issues um, for yourselves. I don't like the terms, you know, liberal, conservative and all that. I think they're less than useful. But there is this school of thought now. I've heard Professor George would say it. Floyd Abrams has written about it in the Soul of the First Amendment. That we're now seeing, Nadine Strassen said, we're now seeing people who we thought of as liberals, civil libertarians, really as the censors of speech now. And that's a so, shocking phenomenon. So it's David, I have my... to ask you, I have to ask you this question because it's very personal to me. I respect Floyd Abrams enormously. I have loved him as a friend and as a mentor. He signed that statement saying that your argument about the First Amendment is legally frivolous, which means you could be disbarred for having made it and irresponsible and that no jurist or scholar would ever make it. How do you explain that our friend Floyd Abrams would attach his name to something as McCarthyite as the statement 
that your argument was legally frivolous and, and in a scholarly and juristic way irresponsible. I, I, I'm going to have to call him on the phone and ask him, but yeah. uh, I've been, I haven't wanted to because I admire him so much. I just cannot imagine why he signed that outrageous statement. I think you're 100% right. And you were so gutsy to speak out against that, against the 144 so-called scholars at the time. It's interesting you invoke McCarthy. I just started reading lately Thomas's book, Even the Angels Wept, about you know the McCarthy era and stuff. There is that stuff now. That, that's what's going on now to a great extent. I can't explain the Floyd Abrams phenomenon except to say it seems like the name Trump changes everything for people in academia or you know so-called scholars. Floyd Abrams is you know, one of the First Amendment guys of our generation. It's shocking. Not only, their other arguments were shocking. They likened the president to a low level um, civil employee of right. the government who can uh, have his, his or her First Amendment right, what we think of as First Amendment rights. Anyway, their speech curtailed to some degree. And they said flat out, First Amendment does not apply to anything the president says. That's just dead wrong. United States Supreme Court has said so. I, I can't imagine Floyd Abrams knowingly knew that that argument was gonna be made also, that just goes well beyond the pale. Anyway. That's wild. So, 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 so the censorship, uh, just to follow up. So the only thing you can do is, is they'll lose money and revenue and maybe they'll reassess. So is that- Congress is gonna, act, is gonna have to act one of these days um, to remove their immunity for a number of things. For example, you know, there've been lawsuits, um, victims of Hamas against Facebook and Facebook has been found to have immunity. Judge Garifus in the Eastern District of New York, you know, ruled in Facebook's favor, sort of grudgingly. He thought that they were irresponsible, but, um, but you know, until they face some sanction in the pocketbook for this censorship, I think it's gonna continue. And they all seem to be of the same mindset. Um, listen, you know, I don't follow or subscribe to policies of some people who they have censored. I still wanna hear it. I wanna know that it's out there. The same thing with the Ku Klux Klan or the Nazi cases. People say, how could you represent them? Let them get someone else. It's true they could have gotten someone else. Although at the time the ACLU wasn't finding a lot of takers. I personally want to know that they're out there. I would prefer to have their viewpoint out in the open rather than having them all operate under the cover of darkness. I believe in the concept of the marketplace of ideas. Yep. And I, I have enough confidence in our government and our people to think they will reject those ideas. That's one of the things through this period that has shocked me about people like Congressman Al Green, or Schiff or Nadler, when they say we have to impeach because we just can't trust the American people, they may reelect Donald Trump. That's our way our system works. I, they don't speak, you know, I, the majority of the American people, voters elect President Trump. That's their business. That's our system. He is our president. Right. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I'm going to invite the uh, rabbi back if he has some questions because we're coming on the hour. Rabbi, did you have any questions for, uh, for Alan or for uh, David? Yes, uh, most definitely. First of all, I want to thank you both for a really a fascinating and intriguing uh, presentation, uh, lively and um, quite uh, stimulating. I know you both are very busy, so we definitely appreciate your time. I know you should both know that Fifth Avenue Synagogue also has origins at the Torah Vedas. Uh, the founders, uh, one of the founders of the synagogue, was, was instrumental in building the, um, the yeshiva. So perhaps everyone knew each other um, uh, way back, uh, way back when. Just a couple of follow-up questions to um, to uh, something you mentioned, uh, David. That um, you know, people usually think that education is reserved for the clergy and the teachers, and they're the ones who are responsible to uh, educate the masses. Um, but what they don't realize is that sometimes the most powerful uh, educators are the non-clergy when they demonstrate uh, by example, which is something that you touched upon um, with the comments that you're getting from uh, around the country and the world. So what would you say to a, a young uh, professional who's about to start their career and they have a conflict about uh, wearing a yarmulke, uh, taking off days from work, the holidays always fall out in September and uh, that's usually when the work year starts and, and they're afraid that if they do adhere to, to their values and their religion that it will uh, set them back in their career advancement. So what type of words of encouragement and insight uh, could you possibly uh, offer to these young people? You, know, you already, thank God, had a successful career. This was actually a very big case, obviously, but uh, you have established yourself already, and these people are looking to establish themselves. Yeah, it's a great question. First of all, I would tell them to call you. Um, and then <laughs> beyond that, um, it's not easy. It's not easy. It's very easy for me at my age to be able to tell them who are you know, struggling to get a job at a big firm or something like that, um, how to approach it. 
I've made uh, I've made compromises. I have a position now. If I argue a case in front of a judge on a motion, I wear my yarmulke um, wherever I am, pretty much. If I argue a case, if I have a jury trial, I do not. I had an experience not long after Crown Heights in which the defendants actually were wearing yarmulkes. And there's a juror who was acting noticeably antagonistic toward them. And sure enough, we found out when we voir dired the jury afterwards, they came back guilty on some counts, not guilty on others. And a juror called me up and said that she wanted me to know that one of the jurors, the one who had been seeming so seemingly so antagonistic, said to us, forget about the evidence. You know it's the Jews that bring the drugs into our community. We have to vote to convict them. So people draw a stereotype. I've felt that it's not appropriate for those stereotypes to inure to my client's detriment from a juror who may just look at me, can't get past the yarmulke, and uh, so on. So a young person going into a firm might make the decision. That firm is not for her or him, if that's or for him in the case of a yarmulke, that, that, if that's going to be you know, a major defining issue. Some pe young people, uh, it's a quandary for them. Do they wear it during their interview to at least set the stage so the person knows? Or they take it off and then are they accused of having hidden it or something? I don't think they're easy questions. I wish they were, and they should be an easy question. Um, but I don't think it's so easy. I think each one has to evaluate on his or her own. At the end of the day, I would hope that the person's home support is enough, shul support is enough. So they feel that I'm not going to make the ultimate compromise. I've got to be true to my values and my beliefs. And if it's such an issue at this place that they feel uh, it would be a disqualifying factor, then maybe it's not the place for me. Mm -hmm. Can I add to that just one uh, autobiographical Please. reference? So uh, I, I was from a Shabbos all through law school and all through uh, my clerkships. And when I applied to uh, a job, the firm of Paul Weiss, Rifkin, Wharton and Garrison, the most prominent Jewish firm in New York, offered me a job. I was editor in chief of the law review. I was first in my class and all that. And then Simon Rifkin, who was the senior lawyer in the firm, called me in. He was also the chairman of the board of the Jewish Theological Seminary, very active Jew. And he called me in and he said, I, 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 we've given you the job, but I noticed that it says you can't work on Saturday. Um, is it because you have like a young child at home? I said, no, it's because I'm Sabbath observant. He said, well, we can't have you at this firm. At this firm, we need somebody who's available to me seven days a week. And so the following year, uh, that was a summer job. So the following year, I got a job with the Supreme Court, Justice Goldberg, and I wrote him a note when he offered me the job. I said, I have to tell you that I can't work on Saturday. And if you want to withdraw the offer, he called me in. He said, how dare you? even mm -hmm. suggest that I would withdraw an offer. Of course you can come and be my law clerk and not work on, on, on Saturday. And uh, I'll, I have a law clerk who's not Jewish. He works on Saturday. I have you, you work on Sunday. That way I'm covered seven days a week. <laughs> but I grew up with this because my great grandfather, uh, Zachariah Dershowitz, who came over from Poland, worked in the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory. You remember that? Oh, yeah. And there was a fire and all the people, so many people, like 90 people were killed in the fire. The fire was on Shabbos and he wasn't killed because he didn't work on Shabbos. And yeah. I grew up with that story. And the story I grew up with was that he would get a job as a part, you know, just a, 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 a worker and he would work six days. And then when he couldn't work on Saturday, they'd fire him. And then he'd go to another place, get another <laughs> job for six days. And he wasn't in the triangle building when he was uh, when he would otherwise have been killed. So I'm here as the result of my family being Shober Shabbos. So I have to be very respectful of that, obviously. Can Thank you imagine you that some places cancel this guy from speaking? Everything he says is something you want to hear. Every story and every bit of wisdom <laughs> you want to hear. And you're crazy if you miss it. Go uh, ahead, Rabbi. Uh, one follow up uh, question to you. That's something that you uh, touched upon briefly. You did mention that in theory, you could have made the, fin the final arguments without technically violating the Shabbat. You could have stayed close by, not signed anything, um, but you made the active decision that even though technically according to halacha, you may have been able to circumvent uh, any violation, you still decided to withdraw. So if you could explain a little bit about your thinking in terms of that uh, decision. Yeah, I thought that uh, it would have just sent the wrong message. It would have appeared like this is more important than my religious observance. Now, I, I say this, I also said before, I do death penalty cases. Fortunately, most judges don't hold court on Saturday. We had a judge in Alabama, Frank Johnson, was one of them, a wonderful judge, 
but he was a very stern guy. He would have court on Saturdays at some time, never in a case I had. But um, but anyway, I thought if I just showed up there, then it would be like maybe I don't know, the two things are equally important. They aren't in my life. Um, it wasn't a question of a Kulach Nefesh. It was a, an impeachment trial and somebody else could do it. And um, I think it would have sent the wrong message, frankly. It certainly wasn't in keeping with the spirit of Shabbos. That's for sure. And uh, so I spent Shabbos like I would ordinarily. As I say, I walked to the shul six and a half miles away. We had a very nice Shabbos. I was eager to find out the result, I must say. Um, but, you know, Shabbos is out relatively early these days. So, uh-huh. so uh-huh. I, have a wonderful, I have a wonderful final story on that. So I come to teach at Harvard. And, you know, for me, kid from Borough Park getting a job <laughs> at Harvard, I'm the first day I'm there, I get my assignment to teach. And I'm teaching criminal law on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. So I go to see the dean and I say, I can't teach on Saturday. Uh, He says, we have to. Uh, All first year classes are on Saturday. We do it purposely because we don't want students to go away for the weekend. So we have Saturday until noon. Don't worry, you'll be free at noon. (laughs) I said, I'm sorry, I just can't do it. Well, you have to do it. I can't make a special rule for you, he said. So about three days later, I get calls from all of my faculty colleagues congratulating me because as the result of me not wanting to not being able to teach on Shabbos and as a result of the dean who is very religious Protestant not wanting to give me special preference he canceled all Shabbos classes (laughs) forever and ever after that and uh, as a result of that I became the most popular teacher at Harvard (laughs) for at least a short period of time because I got Saturday classes canceled. That's yeah. beautiful. I could just say one final comment. Uh, you know, I have to give you a lot of credit because it sounds like that uh, you didn't even, uh, you know, ask anyone on the street during the course of Shabbos of what uh, what happened when we were a kid and you know the Yankees won the, the World Series. <laughs> sure. Um, we didn't wait till after Shabbos to ask people on the street whether or not uh, the Yankees won or not. So that is quite impressive that you uh, withstood the temptation till uh, Shabbos departed to actually find out what happened in the case. Well, I won't give away the secret, but I grew up with a very, very man who's now a very Orthodox rabbi. You're going to all want to guess, and I'm not going to tell you, but a very prominent Orthodox rabbi. And his father allowed the television to remain on on Shabbos, you know, the whole time. And we all went to his house during the World Series to watch the games on Shabbos because he didn't turn it on or turn it off. My family, they wouldn't allow that. But uh, we had in Borough Park different rules for different folks. So, so, so amazing, Alan. Thank you. Really amazing, both of you. Your, your dedication to Shabbos is a truly uh, <laughs> remarkable. Thank you. Yeah, th- th- David, before we end, something Alan is doing this week, he's speaking to high schools about uh, college campuses and anti-Israel sentiment. Is that an area you're also mentoring students with? Well, I, I'm issue? active. I, I hope found this thing called the Center for Law and Justice, a Zionist organization. Of America run by a woman named Susan Tuckman. And so we're active on the campuses now in fielding complaints. And this is a, a, a as Dershowitz knows as well as anybody, very, very uh, serious issue on campus now. Um, yeah. It's got students petrified, violent stuff and the nonviolent intimidation and all that also. Um, yeah, very important issues. Great. So, so first of all, you guys are both just a kid Hashem. It's great to have two uh, brilliant legal minds that happen to be uh, both the lawyers for the first impeachment, the second impeachment. But uh, we're really grateful to have you both. And Alan, forget about 92nd Street Y, forget about Temple Emanuel. Just remember Fifth Avenue Synagogue. Of course. Well, of about course. Those names. And, and David, we look Anytime. forward to having you when you come for Shabbos. That'd be an honor. And, and uh, really amazing your Kiddush Hashem and how you inspired so many people. And please keep up the great work. And thank you uh, really for uh, your time this evening. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Rabbi, and thank you for having Professor Dershowitz as part of the show. It uh, made the night and for me also. Thank sorry you to have so much of your time, David, but you oh, got please. me started. So you inspired me, and so I had to, I had to share my insights as well. I but you lots of money for this opportunity, so thank you. Thank you. Be thank well, you. Bye, guys. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you for those inspiring words. Thank you.